The idea was always to build a family for those kids that don't have one. Welcome back, everybody. Rich Baker, Shanghai-based mission-driven entrepreneur, here today with another episode of the Mission Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. Today, I'm joined in this episode by the amazing Jimmy Pham, who's the founder of Vietnam's first and one of its leading social enterprises, Koto, or No One Teach One. Through the last two decades, he's been working to create opportunities for thousands of youth through the teaching of hospitality skills. It's a great honor to have you with us. As a starting point, would you mind introducing yourself and the and the mission that you're on? So I came to Vietnam in those days, it's considered as a, a, a third world country. So poverty was everywhere. We only have a couple of days of electricity. There's no traffic light, there's no cars, definitely. As a registered from the, the war, there's a lot of street kids. So I immediately went to all those street kids that I saw in Ho Chi Minh, you know, got them accommodations and, and uh, put them through English classes and, and all kinds of The mission at that time was to help a few kids. And then you mm -hmm. said that you do more because there's more need. Uh, and then you 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 kind of so sort of believe in this, you know, children today, the world tomorrow. You help a few kids through, then we're like, okay, I've done it a couple of times. I'm going to start an organization called Kodo or was there a progression from there? My work is a tour guide. So I was traveling all through in, uh, Indochina. So I was in Thailand, up in the hill tribes, down to the beaches uh, side of Natrang and Cambodia and you know all that kind of stuff. So everywhere I see uh, street kids, I would help them throughout my own expenses working as a tour leader. And the kids I was helping in Hanoi, that's where Koto is now, there was nine of them. And, uh, and then basically one day they pulled me aside, uh, Rick, and they said to me, you know, basically we trust you now so we're going to tell you the truth we basically we've been taking you for a ride but we come to realize that you know for the, the last four years you, you didn't budge so mm -hmm. basically we need jobs yeah. we don't want this anymore and that's began the 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 mission that the, the mission changes to now wanting to give them that fishing rod that they can fish for the whole life long so what is Coda? what does it do and what is the change that you're trying to create through the organization originally the Koto um is an acronym for no one teach one it's a it's just that encouragement that you know uh, uh once help help others so the program is a two-year program it's a living program is uh, uh we use the uh the help from from australia curriculum in vocational education training and hospitality so they get certified which give them a pathway we work with a major language center called Apollo, which teaches them about business English and, and English for hospitality. So that encompasses it for the two years while in the process building a family, because a lot of them yeah. come from damaged backgrounds, um, fragile, neglected, abused, abandoned, uh, uh, the minority, the underserved, the disadvantaged, all the things that typically that, you know, uh, society call that they um, useless. Yeah, they're a menace yeah. to society, and we take those kids, change their mindset and their attitude, and uh, and the two years um, put them through this training and empowerment that gives that become hospitality empowered uh, professionals. What was the challenge of actually fulfilling the dream that you were selling to them? Because you give them this two year package, and then you have to give them the job as well. So. On the other end of this, how challenging was it to set that part up? So the challenge has always been, the first one is we literally have to go on the streets and basically say, come and trust us, right? And mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, once you're in the environment, the peer-to-peer -peer helps a lot. Throughout the two years, we always invite a lot of the alumni, which we have a very um, active alumni, to come back and say, look at me. <laughs> yeah. And that all helps them to re uh, reaffirm that this is where they can go as well. But yes, the first couple of years was very difficult. Even today, sometime, not that much now, but sometime a program that gives you free training, gives you an international to get, helps you a pathway to go overseas and, and potentially break out of, uh, not only break out of poverty, but actually be successful financially. Mm -hmm. uh, and all that kind of stuff as well. It's very hard to believe. What is your business model? How do you make that work with hundreds of kids now? So the business model has always been is that you have a, we have a, a practical training, which is a restaurant that's been mm -hmm. servicing tourism for you know uh, for the last twenty years. Uh, Pre COVID, we were seventy percent sustainable. Good products good service, it's good ambience, it's competitive. So we don't use the whole charity angle. 
Well, I, I think it's interesting you mentioned a few times kind of charity in a way that makes me think that you don't find that to be a good model for your for yourself or for the work that you're doing. And I'm, if you just said, I'm a nonprofit in Vietnam, you would have just been overwhelmed by the money <laughs> from the UN and everybody. Like, that would have yeah. been a much easier route. Why why not yeah. go that route? I think because uh, when you're trying to, you work your whole life trying to empower people to, uh, you know, the kids that we're trying to help is that, you know, be independent, be strong. Uh, and all the kinds of you just can't open your palms all the time to receive money. Uh, mm. it, it's not sustained. Number two is when we receive funds, and and please don't take this the wrong way. Is that when we take funds, we have just very donor driven agenda. They change the programs, they do this, and you spend so much time reporting and uh, crossing the T's, dot the I, doing all the checks and balances, and they're all good because it's one of those polarity where you know this is an energy that you know is is just continue uh, so yeah. it's not wrong or right it's just one of right. those things that just happened right yeah uh, for us it's um that's not the route we want to take we want to you know for a small social enterprise where we become the leader in changing uh the way things are uh, the things of doing business and that's why yeah. we have to lead by example for our kids but also for for the community in which we work in and we, we will continue to do that when you were starting Kodo, what was your vision for the organization? Like, what was the size and scale that you were hoping for? You know, and then how did that provide the foundation for actually the, the organization itself? Like, how did how did you approach building that? I um, when I started this, I wanted to help a whole bunch of kids mm -hmm. uh, to have a future. And if I walked away after a couple of years, uh, knowing that uh, their life is a bit easier, uh, then I, I found that I, I achieved my goals yeah. through the the journey is that I can do more and I should do more. It's my responsibility to do more. Um, and I evolved and say, hey, this is bigger than me in a sense that through this, I can communicate to the rest of the world on how to, uh, how by leading a, by example, mm -hmm. is building active alumni is to be, you know, um, the first social enterprise that go from medium size to large scale impact, building ecosystems around of, you know, uh, how you can help more people. And it, it's exciting, it's challenging, but it's, it's exciting. So the mission has somewhat evolved. Uh, I wouldn't say changed, because the, 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 the idea was always to build a family for those kids that don't have one. What's been the challenge of growing this organization from a handful to, to hundreds now? Like what, what are the big milestones that you look back on as being like where you made you know, organizational transformation to make that happen. The first, the first ten years is always about innovation, about being a disruptor. It's about, calling. and at some point you need to go tradition as well. So you can't have an organization that grow without compliances, without all the, you know, the uh, regulatory that needs to build capacity to make it sustainable, to have accountability and transparency and all that kind of stuff. So our organization need those tools. So you're always evolving and changing and, and being innovative in your approach to to um, to development, right? And mm -hmm. to the people that you target. Uh, but at the same time, you still need to be grounded and, and be consistent. That's incredible. So how, how do you even come up with this these ideas and this vision? How do you look at success then? Like you, you have all these things that you got to get done. I mean, is it is just the number of people? Do you have a, do you have a, how do you measure success? Do you know, I get asked that a lot as in, you know, can you give us a couple of success stories from the, the graduates? And and my reply to them is that to the 1,700 kids that graduate from Prokoto or currently in Kodo is successful. If a, is a, is a housemaid, girl who slept on this kitchen floor never get to see the mausoleum and now able to bring her daughter to see that that success oh. uh, a street kid who uh, used to shine shoes and now have his own coffee shop and um uh, able to you know um uh, look after his wife and kid that's success yeah. right or someone who's uh, used to sleep on a stairwell uh and sell sticky rice as a street kid and now just finished yale you know, yeah. so all this is success because if you can, because of this program, your life is better than it was yesterday or the kids are in the program that no longer feel hungry or feel scared uh, because they're protected and feel safe. That's success rate to me. I, you know, it's never the uh, <clears throat> the big thing that people are looking for. It's actually, it's the, it's the one picture. It's the one interaction that you look back on and go, okay, yeah, we got something right that day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know, for me is that, you know, um, I was always about coming to Vietnam and uh, feel that you just 
being a part of something amazing, but contributing to something amazing. And if you walked away, they're still feeling that and still loving what you do. Mm. Um, it's um, you have a purpose. It's no longer it's your work. It's you know yeah. it's your purpose. You no. Know? Well, and and kind of following on that, it, 23, 24 years as a founder is a very long time. Um, exactly. What what keeps you going? Uh, is is purpose <clears throat> the source of fuel, or what, what is it that keeps you moving down this track when you're when you're hitting these hard harder roads? There there are two things. Mm-hmm. One is um, every morning you go into this you know the school and to the restaurant, and you get this all this beaming smile at you. And say good morning and how you interpret that is basically thank you for my future mm. and that is the fuel that keeps me uh going to this mm. day 24 years if you talk to me i'm still very passionate about what i do yeah. that's number one. number two is seeing a bit further ahead because as a leader you have to and the vision is that where it potentially can go you know what i mean the impact it yeah. can create and the the the, the in, uh, inspiring for other people to 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 be that change yeah. uh, it keeps me going because I, I know that um it's not just about koro it's about a community that we're trying to build around us as well how has your role as the founder changed over the years i mean initially it was all on you to do everything <laughs> Now yeah. it sounds like you've got a, you got an MD in place. Like, what do you view as your role going forward? And I think my role is yeah. um, is to put in a succession planning in place, uh, do the bigger things that keep Koto become uh, number one sustainable, uh, mm-hmm. both capacity and oh, my ideal is to have ninety percent of my staff uh, Koto alumni, which uh, at the moment is forty percent. Number two is um, um, to have um, an impact that is, is quite quite good, uh, mm-hmm. have an ecosystem around of support and all that kind of stuff, and finally leave a legacy. And then fi- eventually, when you walked in to a fundraiser of Coda somewhere around the world, uh, a CEO who, who happened to be an alumni that got mm-hmm. up there and said, my name is such and such, and and I would be in the in the audience just clapping, and she or he wouldn't know who I am. Right, right, right. right. Uh, and that that will be the ultimate um, ultimate joy. It's a tough one because you think about like what's your legacy within the organization, and what do you want it to be, and you know how do you make sure that that's fulfilled? I mean, it's it's a learning journey, and you mentioned failure and learning. How do you how do you look at failure now versus say ten years ago? Like, is now everything like just a lesson? instead of like this crisis and how have you learned to adapt to or embrace the failures so that the organization itself can lead to the greater vision i don't think that anything that i do is a is a failure such i use the word very loosely i call it a lesson learned i think like a captain in an open sea you can't be a great captain if you haven't never gone through a storm there's so many times that you know we're close to closing shops because we're doing something so unreasonable and or everyone around you tells you that you know you you know that you're doing the wrong thing right right uh and then you 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 know you give everything you have and that sometimes you're just so tired and and all that kind of stuff um where now you build this capacity that when you're tired you just rest a little bit and someone else can take over if i can look back at all the mistakes i made um i put that uh is i can write a book on it right yeah, yeah. but i think that um as long as you grow from it uh and you become uh resilient from it and then yeah. you use that uh, in your favor to teach others. It's, it's again, it's all about paying it forward. Tying, paying it forward and lesson, teaching others. If you were speaking to a young mission-driven <clears throat> entrepreneur, what two or three pieces of advice would you give them to help them get a little bit further on their path, maybe a little bit faster with a little bit less pain than, than what you or I went through? <laughs> you know, I uh, depends. If you ask a, a, a social entrepreneur, is that uh, use a business model to apply a, a, a social mission because a lot of people think that I have a, because I'm doing great that means that everyone else is supporting me and that's just far from the truth you know when you when you do something have a very solid plan of where you're going what who you are and and your capacity and then go from there what are two or three things that you think young founders don't get right in their early journey i think the first one is they learn from university they get you know their master's degree and all that kind of stuff and they don't have that kind of the in the the real life skills mm-hmm. uh, and they need to listen more 
you have to be adaptable to the culture. Mm. You have to be adaptable to the environment, who you are, who you're targeting, all that kind of stuff plays a very important part. So it's not like one size fits all. Right? Yeah, yeah, That's sure. That's very important. And if you're working in this part of the region, please, please take culture into consideration. Uh, right. There's certain things that works in the U.S., uh, but it won't work here, guarantee. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm taking a few things away here. And one is I, I definitely believe, you know, each person's unique and how you build your organization is unique. And you're very focused on, you know, you went from fish to fishing rod to a whole Revolutionizing different- Revolutionizing the fishing industry. Right. And so it's like for you to come back, like, it's like, yes, there's, there's organizations who are set up just to help people get through the next few days. You chose, you know, not to build that organization, but I would argue that both are required. We all have very unique stories. All of us are succeeding and failing in spectacular ways and hopefully through this ecosystem, learning to grow um, together, right? To grow the impact, to grow our organizations, whatever it may be. Nothing's easy but it's all supposed to be meaningful or worth it, right? <laughs> correct, correct, exactly. So, yeah, uh, so. I think we all have our own journey and our own challenges as well. It's just the attitude is so important. 